This is Autoline After Hours with John McElroy and Gary Vasilash, episode 553 for April 22nd of 2021, Making Cars with Sustainable Materials. Watch Autoline After Hours live at Autoline.tv every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 12 p.m. Pacific. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. AutoLine After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, solutions for your journey, and by Magna. Hello, Gary. John, how are you? Doing well. How about Happy yourself? Happy Earth Day. Happy Earth Day. Oh, that's right. Today's Earth Day. It is. Yeah. So, so, so for today's what day is it quiz or what happened on this day, I, I assiduously tried to find a, a Earth Day related thing. And I came up with something, but there was no way for me to figure out how to make a question that would be reasonable for you to answer. And it was that in, in 2010 today, the Deepwater Horizon structure sank. Ooh, right. And, wow. and it was two, so it was two days after the fire. So two days later, then boom, the thing went down and the oil was gushing and, and uh, it was bad, bad news. But I, I did find something else that has automotive implications. And it happened today in 2016. So what was it? And for bonus points, where did it happen? <laughs> Jeez, I have no choice, no, no chance with this whatsoever. So 2016, something happened that was automotive. And I guess it was, it's, it's big implications for the auto industry, big implications for the auto industry. I give what the Paris Accord was signed. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. So, so maybe you can get the bonus points. Okay. Uh, where, mm -hmm. uh, is this like, where's. Grant Perry <laughs> or what, or yeah, or, or what, what city do Boston beans come from? It's gotta be Paris, right? New York at the United Nations. Oh, there. See, I'm, I'm so glad I'm, go. I'm watching the show. I'm learning something new every day. <laughs> We're trying. Hey, let's bring in our, our cohorts here. Christy Schweinsberg from Ward's intelligence and Lindsay Brooke from SAE international. Hello out in virtual land. Hi guys. Hello. How are you? Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having, Thanks for having us. Christy, I'll bet you knew the answers to those. No, unfortunately oh. my trivia these days consists largely of pop culture. So I'm sorry. I, All right. I, I didn't know the answer. Oh, well, next time. Yeah. I'll, I'll study up. I'll study up next time. How about okay. you, Lindsay? You knew all that? I didn't know that, and I would have guessed Paris, obviously. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, basically, it was in, in, in the previous year that was where they organized the whole thing, but they needed to have the signatories, so they did it at the United Nations. And, of course, I think they picked Earth Day because hmm, it's Earth Day. <laughs> but I, I think maybe our guest might know about this. Let's bring her in. Debbie Malusky, how are you? I didn't yeah. know about it. A actually, I remember 2016 and the Paris Agreement getting signed and a bunch of nerds in my lab just having a big party. That's all I remember. <laughs> <laughs> Debbie, just so our audience knows. All right, so, so quick thumbnail. What do you do it for? It? I am the newly minted uh, technical fellow of sustainability at Ford. And so I've invested about the past 20 years in sustainable materials like soy foam, wheat straw, things like that in our vehicles. And technical right, Debbie, fellow, so what does that mean? Yeah. yeah. What does technical fellow mean? Technical yeah. fellow means beyond materials. Uh, the Ford organization would like to see me expand into uh, uh, carbon neutrality and battery disposal and recycling and everything green, our own manufacturing emissions, everything green. So I'm totally geeked about this new position. But uh, my understanding too is that technical fellow is something that was created, not just at Ford, but in other places, uh, for technical talent to really go out and do their thing. Whereas before this, if you wanted to be promoted, make more money, get all that stuff, you had to go on a management track. And yes. 
Yes. You know, it's maybe you don't want to do that. But a lot of people did do that because they wanted to do better in their careers. So this technical fellow thing was created for very bright people. I, I'll add, I, I can say that about you, I'm sure. Uh, just so our audience knows what that whole term is and why it came about. And I have to tell you, I didn't have the talent to do the business end. And so I was fantastic in the lab, a little braggy, braggy, but but everybody around me was moving up and, uh, you know, on the business side, and I just had no interest at all. And so thank goodness there is a technical path. And I'm one of 16 technical fellows in the history of the company. And I think we in the lab, we have two currently besides myself. So it's a it's a coveted position. And it took me forever, over 30 years to get there. <laughs> So Debbie, Ford, uh, go, go ahead, go ahead, Gary. I was going to say, I was going to say, Lindsay uh, or Debbie, that that Ford has has long been interested in environmental materials, going back to Henry Ford. Um, is is that where you got some inspiration? I wish I could say that it was such a neat package, but I can't. So what happened was I was raised at the lab by two really great scientists, and when they retired, they handed the mantle to me. Look, I looked in the mirror and said, oh my God, I hate plastic. I can't leave plastic. How am I going to leave plastics? I don't even use plastic. And so I sort of made my own lemonade out of those lemons. And I said, well, then I'm just going to work on green plastics. And that was in 2000. I was thrown out of every conference room within the company. The only one who kept me floating was Bill Ford because he was also a believer. So he always used to stand in the front of my presentations and not, you know, sort of block for me, make sure pe people didn't knock me over. Um, and so realistically, we launched Soy Foam um, 2007, late 2007 on the Ford Mustang, and people ended up loving it in, as far as you guys, like media, and there was a big positive reaction to it. And so that's how we sort of got interested. And then people were calling me after that and saying, you know, Henry Ford did this. And I was like, really? I better go look that up. And turns out he was squeezing soybeans at the Rouge. He was doing the exact same chemistry that I was doing, but putting it into coatings, paint, and I was putting it into foam. And he was using wheat straw in steering wheels. I was using wheat straw in bins. And so a little bit embarrassing, the reality of it is I was a copycat, but many, many, many years down the road and had no idea. <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll tell you how old I am. When I first got into this business, you know, what are those Ford buildings? They called them the washer and dryer, the salt, you know, uh, oh, yeah. Just, yeah. Just salt and pepper shaker at Ford Road and uh, the, the Southfield. That was a soybean field when I got into this business. And it was directly from Ford's experimentation with soybeans. Yeah, he loved the soybeans, served dinners where every course included soybeans in it, down to dessert, wore a suit with soybean fiber, didn't know how to wash it, but beyond that, it was a beautiful suit. <laughs> um, and he, like what he really thought was agriculture and industry should partner together. So I'll use your soybeans and you buy my trucks. And I think that's just way forward thinking. Um, for his time. And I think it's a good, it's a great thing. Like people love to see, farmers love to see soybeans in their seats or wheat straw in their bins. I've got to go out for some Thai food tonight because the discussion about soy is just too much for me right now. But Debbie, <laughs> I've got, I've got a question from one of our readers uh, that's directly related to this and I'll read it to you. Um, last fall, we ran a piece uh, about Ford uh, the headline was materials Ford envisions broad portfolio of renewable materials, including coffee. Uh, and this sparked a reader, a, a letter from one of our engineering readers. And this reader says, I am concerned, however, that we are making automobiles more of a smorgasbord for rodents. For example, I've heard there are expensive problems with rodents eating the soy based insulation used in automotive wiring systems. Attached is a photo of a rodent damaged wiring harness in a like new Jeep Trackhawk. And so this engineer reader asks, are any rodent repelling ingredients such as bitterly, extremely bitter pepper or, or, or other bitter flavors added to these renewable based materials for this reason? Wow, this is so interesting to bring this up because 
Um, yes, we've heard the same accusations, the same issues with uh, animals being attracted to our materials. Now, for soy-based foam, we do so much chemistry on that uh, soy uh, material, soy oil. We hydroxylize it, we react it with an isocyanate, we foam, we cover it with three layers of fabric. I wasn't worried about it. And realistically, how many rodents enter the vehicle? You got a bigger problem if rodents are entering the vehicle. But um, it's those we, Jeeps, you know, forget it. <laughs> we are, so we have never put soy into wiring. And if you're as old as I am, John, I'm going to say I'm in your category of being old. And I have a classic car, that Boss Mustang in the picture behind me. Um, that's always a risk. Rodents love soft plastic wiring, and it's been happening forever. Um, we didn't have any soy in our wiring. And I bet that the other automotive companies haven't either. And that's why none of these uh, legal challenges have ever uh, had any merit. Now, I have gone above and, above and beyond. A lot of our materials we do test for rodents. We have never seen a preference. And so if the material is being eaten by rodents, my, my guess is it's eat, being eaten by it because it's soft and chewy and they sharpen their teeth and not because it has a, a bio-based material in it. Hmm. Uh, never seen any preference. And, you know, we have to think about it where it's encased in plastic. If we're talking about the McDonald's coffee chaff headlamps, there's 20% coffee chaff encased in polypropylene. It's hard plastic and not going to happen, right? We've tested, uh, we've looked at mold growth. We've looked at everything that everybody has a question on. These materials are more robust than traditional materials. Now, Debbie, how, how do your molders like this stuff? I mean, is this really at cost parity to a purely homogeneous plastic, for example? I'd love to talk about all these issues. So, um, yes, there is no reason that coffee chaff, which is the skin that comes off of beans during the roasting process, and that McDonald's plantations has, have sitting in piles all over the ground. Um, it's above ground. It's ready to go. Um, it shouldn't be more expensive than something that is mined like talc. Uh, the problem is we're putting it in at very low volume. So we'll put it in on one vehicle line at low volume and we got to meet cost parity to get it in. But I think if we can expand these things, we can actually save money. And that material is significantly lighter weight. So we were replacing 40% talc with under 20% coffee chaff. We have met all the mechanical properties and we have a bonus of saving a half a pound per part. So there's reasons to do this and the materials are above ground. So I think, yeah, maybe you have a challenge when you're first and when you're putting it in on one program, but holistically, there's no reason that these materials should be expensive. They're byproducts of agriculture and we're honestly, we're trying to get rid of them. Okay. Debbie, when we um, hear about sustainable materials and vehicles, we're so often focused on the interior materials, the, the things that we see. I'm wondering about your research into using these materials elsewhere. Like, for instance, there's been a lot of talk lately about making battery enclosures uh, out of composites versus aluminum, which is the standard today. Um, I'm just wondering if you have any insight into that uh, area. Can you guys of the hear that? No, you can't nope. hear that? No. Okay. So, yes, um, I would love to see our industry um, sort of converge on a type of material. A thermoplastic would be better than a thermoset because at end of life, we can't deal with a thermoset. We can probably deal with steel or aluminum better than we can with thermoset. Mm -hmm. And so I was actually on a bunch of conversations just today about as, as an industry and within Ford itself, can we um, make sure that we have the same materials being used for all of our battery cases? Just so at end of life, we, we know what we're retrieving. We're not continually changing the materials. Right now, there's 200 different material, plastic materials on a vehicle because we've spent the past 100 years optimizing every single application for its exact, ap uh, its exact properties that they need. And so what if we could get that down to 10? That would make recycling a lot easier. Could you do that? Why not? I mean, you'd have to upgrade some applications and put a material that's a bit better than you absolutely need to do. Um, but I think in the long run, you may bring costs down because complexity is reduced. 
Debbie, you know, speaking of recycling, it's especially good how you're using these materials, recycled materials, post-consumer, as you know, best of all to yes. from an environmental standpoint. But as you also know, if you go to a recycling yard, 100% of the metal gets recycled. The steel, the aluminum, the copper, the zinc, whatever else is in there gets recycled. And there's trucks lined up outside the recycling yard ready to haul it off. They'll pay to get it. Yep. When it comes to glass, zip, all of it gets either dumped in a landfill, maybe some of it gets ground up and used for uh, for uh, paving roads. Where do we stand with plastics? Because the last I looked into this, which goes back some years ago, virtually none of the plastic got recycled. Not that it can't be, yeah. but it was more expensive than virgin material. So all the fluff, as they call it, goes to the landfill. We're still in that same situation, unfortunately, because of the fact that we have over 200 plastics on a typical vehicle. And so how do you sort that? We keep changing the materials that we put in. Um, I think the whole of end of life needs to be reinvented. I visited some recycling facilities. They ask me, what would you like taken off? And I look at the car and I go, okay, I need a big part, but then those fascia are painted. So I don't know how to recycle the paint. Right. And so I think we need to consider holistically, do we do we need to paint? Is mold and color better for the planet? Can we reuse materials that are black? Can we consolidate? It's not impossible. It just hasn't been top of mind. And so when the vehicle comes back 10 years later, we go, oh, well, we could have recycled this if we had taken this into account. So my whole idea is to go around the company and to go within the industry and to say, let's think about it up front, right? We're not gonna spend a bazillion dollars. I mean, I, we're not gonna go broke doing, but there's so many things we can do if we just think ahead. How much Debbie does the, does the end cu customer, the car buyer uh, want this? I mean, do people go in and say, you know, I really like this vehicle body because it's thermoplastic, for example. Um, and, and how much do buyers look at things like, you know, the energy intensity of, of smelting uh, bauxite to make aluminum and the fact that uh, silicon chips are highly water intensive to, 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 make, to make the chips that we have a shortage of today. I mean, how far upstream do customers look and bake that into their buying consideration? Yeah, well, that's a great question. And it's one we're looking at, but I'm not going to look at it too in depth because I know that customers love uh, what we're doing with like, if I can tell them that you can go ahead and have your margarita and we're going to take care of that fiber from agave afterwards and put it into a high end component on your vehicle. They understand the idea of closed loop of sustainable um, and especially when it comes to agriculture and the side products that are associated with it. If we're able to put agave fiber from uh, the tequila industry into our vehicles, we're providing revenue for farmers in Mexico that desperately need it. And so there's so many positives. And I think the younger generation really understands this. I have a daughter studying chemical engineering with an environmental minor. Um, she is very careful about who she buys from and she wants to trust the company. And so I don't think the customer really has to understand, you know, we're going to have steel that has lower impact on the planet. I think Ford needs to think about in order for our customers to trust us, we have to do this on our own. We should do this. We shouldn't ask the customer to pay for it. We should do it because it's the right thing to do. Mm. There is a growing awareness about plastic pollution. I'm wondering, you know, you say you're trying to consolidate the number of plastics, but is there a possibility to sort of reduce the number of plastics to go to metals in certain instances, or is that a non-starter? Well, fuel economy is going to tank if we start substituting metals back in for plastics. And honestly, plastics have brought us incredible safety improvements. Every single airbag goes right through a soft plastic that doesn't shatter at low temperature and cause injury to the people inside the vehicle. So even though I love 1950s, 1960s vehicles, and I look at that metal dashboard, I know we can't go there because we have too many uh, requirements and we're trying to save lives. So we're never going to backtrack on plastics. Um, we have to learn how to deal with them appropriately. And that's probably what's been neglected for the past 30 years. Debbie, you mentioned agave fiber. Now, everybody's yeah. familiar with carbon fiber or glass fibers. Explain this 
to us and the connection with tequila. Okay, so I love coffee. That's why we work with McDonald's. And I also love margaritas. So that's why we're working with Jose Cuervo. And I'm serious. This is how much fun we have in the lab. We, I, I was heading home. I said, you know, I'm going to have margaritas tonight. We should call Jose on Monday and we should ask them what they have left. So the piña that they get um, tequila from is about 70 to 100 pounds. It's this massive uh, fruit. And so they grind it down and they extract the um, agave and you can get agave sugar for cooking or you can get uh, tequila. And so afterwards they end up with a massive amount of, uh, of fiber that is left over. And that fiber sits in piles in, in, in the plantations and rats take up residence in there because it's sugar, it's full of sugar. And so our thought was, could we use this fiber to reinforce plastics? And it turns out you can. And uh, we are in the process of testing that on several different components right now. And so one day my dream may come true and not only my morning coffee, but my afternoon to, uh, margarita will be in a Ford vehicle. The, the natural fibers are beautiful though, because mother nature is incredible. Uh, glass fibers break when you injection mold them, when you reprocess them, carbon fibers break, natural fibers bend. And so we find them infinitely more recyclable at end of life. So not only am I working on the front end, I'm working toward end of life on the back end of being able to keep using the materials in the vehicle. Is it, Debbie, is it too early for, um, for your team to be looking at things like the future of lithium. I mean, there's all sorts of issues around lithium sourcing, mining. Uh, you know, there's some very, very kind of controversial aspects to that, and also uh, rare earth metals that are used in electric motors, dysprosium and rhodium, and so forth. Uh, is this too early in the discussion at Ford, or are you already kind of looking at these? No, my calendar was full of meetings like that just today. Um, I can't sleep at night until I understand that we're going to be able to retrieve everything out of a battery at end of life. These batteries are massive, right? And right now I think the lithium supply is, the demand is gonna outpace the supply within a few years. And so we better be ready, the industry better be ready to take back efficiently everything out of a battery and reuse it. So we're gonna look at the graphite, we're gonna look at the uh, cobalt, the lithium, um, even the battery case. There's no reason we can't reuse that material. It may not be second life in a, as a battery case, but it'll be used for something. So Ford wants to do this on its own. Or are you looking for partnerships with existing uh, battery recyclers? Uh, we're going to start uh, feeling around on our own because we have the luxury of having a laboratory to work on these things. But yes, we'd be interested. Obviously, we're probably not going to be recycling the batteries on our own, but we would partner with people who would work on the technologies that we're developing. How are the batteries dealt with that have been, you know, in the market and maybe you know were damaged in an accident? How how do how does Ford handle those today? Um, I think they are sent to um, certain recycling companies, but there's no one singular process for doing it. And I think it's uh, right now the processes are very energy intensive. They're water intensive. Mm -hmm. um, we need to bring all of that impact down. The last thing we want to do is move to exciting battery vehicles and trade global warming for another environmental problem. And that would be landfilling and continuing to mine for these precious materials. Debbie, how do you close the loop in the sense that you're doing all this wonderful research and coming up with really cool stuff. But what I'm curious is how do you get the design community to recognize how they can design with these materials, what they're capable of or not. Same with the engineering community. Is there a mechanism in Ford to, to get that or does it just happen on a sort of this project might work or that project might work? We're trying to be upfront. So, you know, my uh, naming as technical fellow is I think a, a signal from the company that we're gonna do this stuff more holistically, more big time. And so um, as we start, the design. So I was uh, involved in a meeting this morning on some of our European uh, EVs that are coming out and we were talking about, can we consolidate the case? So I think we're just starting the journey of uh, making sure that we are doing stuff that will benefit us in the future. We haven't really focused on that before. 
right? Like you said, everything was ending up as shredder fluff in the landfill. Uh, we don't want to continue that. Debbie, another place where there's there's lots of waste plastic is in the oceans in terms of things like fishing nets. Now, I understand you guys are actually looking at using some of those materials in vehicles. Yes. So everybody thinks that all this stuff is garbage. I don't think anything's garbage. So the fishing nets are a really prime nylon material and they are only used for a couple of months before fishermen either get them caught on something or they discard them um, just into the ocean. We are trying to uh, provide incentives for them to bring those nets back and it makes perfectly actually better material than we're currently using in some of our nylon applications. And so wouldn't it be beautiful to actually uh, be able to reduce the number of wildlife that are trapped in these nets that have caught on things. Once once they have value to the fishermen, um, to people who are happen to be in the ocean and see them, then I think we'll stand a much better chance of bringing them back. Is there, Debbie, is there kind of a, a focus at Ford to get these, to green light these new materials into uh, F-150 and escape and high volume programs. I mean, they get a lot of, they get a lot of publicity on, you know, mach -E and kind of the new latest uh, green vehicles, but the biggest advantage is to get them into high, high, super high volume production. And so the, the, the teams that kind of have to develop those vehicles, are they given a portfolio of, of materials that they can use or uh, how does that happen? So right now, we, uh, we've had a lot of success with tree fiber. So um, this is not, this is like a byproduct of the lumber industry, almost like a sawdust type material. Um, I love working with trees because they're the most plentiful material we have and the most green material on the planet, right? It's, it's everywhere. And so we take that sawdust compounded in with a polypropylene material, disperse it, uh, mold parts. We have done armrests that are 100% cellulose, replacing glass fiber with weight save. We've moved to a console on um, Lincoln MKX, yes. Um, that was a hybrid with a little bit of glass because we were dropping into a tool that already existed. We had to have glass to hold dimension. And then just recently we moved it to F-150, F-250 for uh, six electrical brackets. So here we're, we're moving these things. People don't like change. And so as we, um, as we are successful with the materials, then we try to move them into these mainstream roles, right? Mm. So um, the hope is that we'll start migrating some of these tree-based materials to other vehicle programs and other, uh, it, it's a really fine substitute for a glass-filled material. Mm. Gosh, you're, you're sounding like you're going back to the old days with Henry Ford. <laughs> you know, Ford used to own its own forests and they used everything in the tree. Nothing went to waste. They even used the bark. And, and when they, you know, got to the end with scraps and everything, they converted into charcoal and the charcoal company still exists today, Kingford Charcoal. So yeah. it, it's amazing to hear you talking about this because Henry Ford was doing this 80 years ago. Well, and it's amazing. So I've invested at least 20 years, a little over 20 years in this arena. When I started, I was so scared because I was like, oh, it's impossible to embrace. Everything is so perfectly engineered and automotive and the plastics have to be perfect blah, blah, blah. Nature is perfect. And honestly, I don't see much special about our commodity materials now. I'll probably get a whole bunch of hate mail for that. But, um, <laughs> you know, to me, they're just commodity materials. And what we're designing and what we're inventing is materials that have extra properties. Some of them absorb energy much better than glass or carbon fiber. And so why wouldn't you focus on, notice that and focus on using it for an energy absorbing application. Uh, the headlamp housing had higher heat deflection temperature. What better for a headlamp where the bulb is producing all kinds of heat, right? So I, you know, I'm like a kid in a candy store. I don't think of these as junk. I don't think of, I think of them as gold. And every time we, you know, dive in and look at things like algae oil, algae oil you make a foam out of that it has viscoelastic properties naturally like the one like a mattress and so imagine a comfort pad on top of your normal foam in the vehicle made out of algae oil so it's just endless is there a requirement debbie that all of these must also have post-consumer utility for generation after generation of recycling or is there a point where they end up ending and 
you know, have the same landfill issue as some of these current materials? It's a mixed bag. So with polyurethane foam, you have a cross-link thermoset and it ends up in landfill no matter what. Our soy-based foams, even though on the front end, we're helping farmers with revenue, we're um, reducing the greenhouse gas emissions, still ends up in landfill, but that bothers us. And so we have projects in um, inventing new molecules that can be recycled at end of life. Even though they are cross-linked, they can still be reversed. And so those are a way off. Um, and and I see this as a complete a, a ever evolving. So even though I put soy foam in now, that may not be the best, uh, most sustainable material in the future. We may move to something else. Hmm. So Bill so McDonough, I'm sure, you, yeah, yeah. Uh, go ahead, Gary. No, I was, was going to say, so, so, so one of the issues, Debbie, it seems to me is, is that Okay, supply chains exist for things like carbon fiber and talc and, and so on. Supply yep. chains don't exist for things like um, agave fibers and, and, and the coffee, whatever you call them. Um, is that why these materials are probably more expensive than using the traditional materials? Well, in some cases, that's true. Um, it, this supply base is certainly smaller, but in other cases, those companies that are uh, developing these brand new materials are not, don't have access to volume pricing for the plastic part. And so time after time, I see the plastic is the problem, not the coffee chaff. It's that they don't have access to a good price for plastics. And so the more, that's why I'm here today. The more people who join and want to use these materials, the more we can scale them to, uh, you know, appropriate pricing for everybody. What's happening with hemp? Oh, we're working on hemp. <laughs> I have a great story about hemp. Uh, had a young uh, intern who was uh, looking for something to do. And I said, well, hey, why don't you head down to the Detroit marijuana dispensary and get some of the leftover stocks? And he looked at me like, are you kidding me? So a few days later, I saw him with a garbage bag and he's like, I'm going. And I go, don't, you look so worried. Why are you worried? He's like, well, I'm worried I'm going to get in trouble. I go, don't worry. If you get arrested, I have never seen you before in my life. <laughs> <laughs> but hemp is a great, uh, great fiber, very stiff, mm -hmm. very high properties. And I wouldn't be surprised if we saw it in vehicles. Hmm. Yeah. Debbie, has Ford used any natural fibers for seeding material? I know some automakers have uh, dabbled with wool. Have you had anything? Uh, in that we realm. are dabbling with fabric as well, blends mm -hmm. of uh, of wool, of, of cellulose fiber from trees. Um, I think the day of leather may come to an end. I don't know, John, what do you think? I mean, well, I, I, young people seem to like other alternatives. Yeah, you know, that, I, I think we're in a process of evolution because, you know, I, I want to say it was a decade ago, maybe longer, Mercedes-Benz offered a leather-free interior. You know, for people who, you know, don't like seeing animals slaughtered just to upholster their car. Nobody ordered it. It just died. It was a lead wow. balloon. But I think it's time will come. Yeah, I, I think Tesla I, I, is offering it now. A, a, a vegan, they call it a vegan interior. Um, and so I think we're going to see more natural materials come to light. I think wool is viewed as a luxury material. And so if we can make it durable enough... Uh, there's no reason that a uh, ethical wool couldn't appear in vehicles as well as a luxury item. Yeah. You, know, you know, another thing, we're going to have to wrap this segment up, but another thing that Mercedes experimented with that I loved was using real rock on the instrument panel. They had a, a trim level where they were using granite. I mean, real rock. It was awesome. It went over like a lead balloon too, though. <laughs> wow. wow. I don't want any lead balloons. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you don't want any lead at all. They probably had on one trim level that was like the one that was not going to sell very well anyway is what I would imagine. That may be. And it went but over I mean, like a looking, granite balloon. If you balloon. guys ever get a chance to stop by our lab in Dearborn, I'd be happy to host you after this COVID thing is over. Um, but we're looking at things like almond shells from the California almond industry. We're looking at lobster shells, which have quite an odor issue, but there are a mm -hmm. lot of lobster shells out on the East Coast. Um, it's just, there's so many materials that we as a society discard 
uh, and I think they're they're beautiful, durable, um, incredible materials that they can be used on anything, not just cars, but we're going to make sure that Ford's using them first. But what is the trade-off, Debbie, real quickly about just having to move these things around? I mean, it, right now it's diesel fuel, diesel fuel, diesel fuel to to pick this stuff up and then sort it in a machine and then ship it somewhere to, to be processed, et cetera. Yeah, my dream is that we will use the materials that are available locally. Now, I don't know if my dream is going to happen, but, um, you know, agave would be used maybe in the plants in Mexico and maybe uh, wheat is grown everywhere so we could use wheat straw everywhere but you could imagine where tomatoes are grown you could use that for certain components and so I, I want to cut back on the amount of um, emissions that are done by by shipping and, and the plastics industry as it stands does a lot of that uh, it has a lot of issues with shipping. Our, our stuff goes back and forth over the, across the ocean several times before we use it in a part. Very good. Debbie, Great. you've been a, ter a, a terrific guest here. It's been a real pleasure having you on the show. And I would love to take you up on a lab tour at some point. It's a great that topic. That would be yeah. fabulous. Fabulous. Happy Earth Day, everybody. Yes. Yeah. We, we will Earth come Day. and visit. We'll bring, we'll bring hemp, coffee. Uh, what yeah. else can we talk tequila. about? Tequila. You got to bring the tequila. Soy yeah. sauce. <laughs> Guacamole. <laughs> well, good. Potatoes, vodka, you name it. Yeah. Here. <laughs> Thanks again, Debbie. And we're going to take a quick commercial break, and we're going to be back talking about all kinds of things in the automotive industry. All right, we're back. That That's was a great fascinating stuff. Yeah, good conversation. Yeah. Very, very good. Yeah, uh, you know, I'm, I'm reminded Bill McDonough, an, an environmentalist guy that that Ford's worked with in the past. You know, he he worked with some Swiss company to come up with fabric, uh, and I think he was working with Steelcase at the time. The fabric was so recyclable. The whole idea at the end is you just cut it off the chair and you throw it in your garden. And it decomposes and lets your your plants and your your vegetables grow. That's very cool. Yeah, yeah McDonough, so. McDonough was the idea. His his idea was from cradle to cradle. So his it wasn't from cradle to grave. He wanted everything that companies would produce be capable of being reused for something else. And uh, that's very cool. Quite, I just wanted to show you guys this. This is I have a compostable phone case. My husband huh. and I both have one of these. So they use corn in this. So Whoa. I'm not so, getting rid of it though. <laughs> it's still darn, I, I, I thought you were going to eat it for us. And, and no, 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 but I love it. It's, it's a cool, cool yeah. design, cool, cool, cool idea. There are a lot of plastic phone cases that get discarded every year, just like a million or something. It's a ridiculous statistic. Well, yes. It, it's, it's very interesting in, um, you know, obviously we had her on the show today because of earth day and, um, The, the commitment of Ford to environmental practices in terms of making stuff is 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 really a, a good thing for the industry, I think. And um, you know, we, we're we're all used to things being done in a certain way because they've always been done that way. And it's interesting for that company to go back, you know, to to as she was saying, you know, Henry Ford using soy oil for paints. I mean, who, who knew that, right? I mean, and um, you know, th that guy was, you know. In, in some ways, an incredible genius, in some ways, a, a really wacky thinker, which was a good thing for the industry. And it's it's too bad that went away. And I hope that some of that's going to be coming back. Yeah, Me I too. think because he came off the farm, I mean, he, that was his roots, you know, he was kind of a farm mechanic. Uh, so he kind of understood these, you know, these things, you just don't keep this stuff laying around and waste it. Um, but, you know, the, the, the subject really brings up a couple of things, just the resilience of steel. I mean, steel is just... It, it, it returns 99 cents on the dollar, you know, from its early use and, you know, from the ore being mined to just constant reuse. Uh, and it's a benchmark in this area, too. 
Um, everything else has kind of, uh, and we didn't talk about tires, but tires are an, still an enormous problem. And Very. some of these topics we've, we've been talking about, I mean, the four of us have been covering the industry for a long time. We've been talking about these topics for a long time. Yeah, it, it does get a little depressing when you think how long it's been and the issues still aren't solved yet. So, you know, I, I was at uh, an SAE uh, meeting. This goes back several decades ago and grappling with the same very issues. How do you recycle all this stuff? And one guy in the audience got up and said, you know, we don't know how to do this. We should just throw it in a landfill because some future generation is going to figure it out and that's going to be a gold mine for them. And, you know, we have this natural abhorrence of throwing things in a landfill, but he had a pretty good point. We didn't know what to do with it. And in yeah. many cases still don't know. Yeah. 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 Well, unfortunately, batteries have some pretty nasty stuff in them. You, you don't want that leaching out into your groundwater, getting into your drinking water. So some yeah. things can be thrown away. I think other things you just can't. Yeah. No, you're right. All right. Okay. So before, I know you've got some topics for us. All right. But before we leave Ford, um, I, I think we ought to, we ought to um, make mention of the fact that uh, Richard Perry Jones, the, the former chief technical officer of Ford, a, a really brilliant guy died. And, um, so I, I'm guessing, John and, and Lindsay, you guys probably knew him. Yeah, and he's really, I credit him and really Hao Tai Tang, who's kind of an acolyte uh, of RPJ in really bringing kind of vehicle dynamics to the forefront at Ford. Um, you know, they use kind of Jackie Stewart as kind of, you know, as, as a front guy for a long time, but it was really Perry Jones and then Hal that really kind of put a put a really fine point on on vehicle dynamics. And I'll never forget, I, I was on a motorcycle ride with Perry Jones uh, out west of Ann Arbor about 15 years ago. And the guy was just, he had, he almost had like human radar in terms of being able to see over hills and around corners. And everybody says when he would evaluate vehicles, he had no problem taking the CEO of Ford out on those kind of rides. And he spent a lot of time uh, after hours uh, at the proving ground. Uh, I, I have huge respect for the guy. And, you know, the story is that he that he died on his farm and there was a tractor incident. And, um, you know, so I, I don't know what the details of that are, but it's it's a shame to hear him uh, of his passing. And I think he had just joined Aston Martin. Is that right? As he was on their board in the last year. Yeah, yes. that's right. I, I Richard was a great guy. And uh he really, you know, Ford had always talked about having great handling cars and good vehicle dynamics, but Richard drove it to a degree yeah. that nobody else at the company had done before that. And and in a very scientific and method, uh, methodical, methodical process. <laughs> yeah, I, I got it out. But uh, yeah, uh, very sad to hear that he was killed in an accident and... Uh, the guy really left his mark on the Ford Motor Company. Yeah, he was probably a high performance tractor, by the way. I'm just guessing, but uh. <laughs> well, too soon, it, Gary. Too soon. It, it made me think of um, you guys. Remember Jack Pitney, uh, who was at, at at Mini and just a brilliant kind of early marketing guy there, and and his tractor flipped over on him when he was trying to pull out a stump. And people don't realize you have to counterweight these things when you're doing yeah. that. And you know, farm tractors look so simple, but man, they will bite you in a yeah. lot of different ways. <laughs> Sorry to hear that. Yeah, yes. what a loss. So um, the Shanghai Motor Show was this week. And I mean, did, did anybody showing in, in Shanghai not reveal a new electric vehicle? I mean, <laughs> yeah, it, I it, was, so. it, it was like everyone. So, so I want to ask you guys. I mean, is 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 this truly going to be the future? Is it is it now a done deal? Is it is it, you know, carved in lithium that we will have electric vehicles? That was for you. No, Chris. I I I don't I don't think so. You know, it, it, talking to I, I did a panel at, at SAE World Congress and have talked to a lot of people. Uh, you know, the people that really kind of seeing into the future based on what customer orders are for engineering, the FEVs and AVLs and Ricardos of the world and the people doing kind of academic uh, studies. And, and just this year, at, at, you know, SAE published about 900 and some papers, and most of them were still about combustion science, after treatment, new fuels. Um, 
we had Tim Frazier, who's the, the CTO of Cummins Diesel on this panel that I was on. And, you know, the, the heavy equipment and, and commercial vehicle world can't just push a button and have electric vehicles tomorrow. So, and we always forget that, that every hybrid vehicle has an IC engine in it. So the forecasts I hear are, you know, 2040, 2050, with, with, still, with still a lot of production. I mean, FEV showed a, a, a hockey stick slide that showed combustion engine production increasing over the next 10 or 15 years. So, you know, I mean, auto shows, as we all know, kind of lead, lead reality in that regard. But I mean, China's building coal plants. They're still building a lot of coal plants. So, and they still use steam locomotives in some of their mines. So it, it's, you know, there's a little bit of smoke and mirrors here, I think, but I think the ICE is going to be around for a long time. Yeah, yeah. As much as I'm an electrification proponent, would love for all these crazy prognostications to come to fruition. I think, you know, you can't change buyer behavior overnight. Uh, and certainly the United States, we don't have regulation yet that's going to see, you know, the end of the ICE. Um, 2% of sales, industry sales in the first quarter were BEVs. I mean, that's an improvement from last year. I think it was like 4% last year, but that's, you can't make a business, an, an automaker can't make, hang their hat, hang, hang the whole company on Bev's at this point. Yeah, the thing to keep a watch on though is political developments. So you've had this week alone, governors of 12 states in the United States come out and ask the Biden administration to set an end date of 2035 for no more ICE uh, vehicles after that. Um, you've got... Uh, the president yesterday saying he wants the U.S. to cut its uh, carbon emissions in half mm -hmm. by the end of this decade. So we can all argue whether that's real or not. And if the market was left to its own, uh, the internal combustion engine would go deep, 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 deep into this century. But I'm starting to see more and more political declarations of getting away from the the IC engine. Uh, I, I think it's easy for politicians to to promise they're going to get rid of those things in 14 years because they're not going to be around yeah. or no longer in office when that happens. Nonetheless, I, I think this growing political element is going to cause some of us, at least me, to reconsider how fast EVs might be adopted. Yeah, no, I think it's a good point, John. And, you know, we'll just have to see that. And of course, these guys can be, you know, quote, flexible in terms of well, 2035, 2040. And I mean, we saw this with, uh, with uh, CO2 regs in Europe. I mean, they just kept sliding and sliding and sliding. And it was based on all of a sudden Europeans woke up and wanted SUVs. So um, I think it's going to be interesting and, and really how they, they're going to be spending a lot of money in this country trying to convince people and kind of enable uh, electrification. But if you don't want it, you don't want it. Or if you can't afford it, I think that's even more important. Uh, then you're just going to wait for it. Yeah, I mean, I really, I like the Biden plan or, well, no, it's not the Biden plan, but there are some uh, representatives that have put forth, you know, having the tax credit be something that you claim at the point of purchase, uh, which is great because if you don't owe any tax, if you don't know $7,500, you're not going to get $7,500 back on that battery electric vehicle. So I like that. Um, I'm not so crazy about the incentives for strictly American manufactured electric vehicles. I think the the segment is too small. The sector is too small right now to play favorites like that. Maybe, you know, yeah. it could be more for, you could get a higher uh, incentive for an American made vehicle, but um, it, certainly the wheels are turning. It looks like something's going to happen, but, you know, on the campaign trail, Biden was, was not for a ban. And so far we haven't seen him change his tune. So we'll, we'll have to see what happens. Well, he reiterated what John was saying uh, about cutting the uh, emissions from the 2005 level um, by 2030 today. He, right. he held, it was part of a uh, Earth Day uh, conference yeah. with, uh, with with um, global leaders, and um, um, she, the um, premier of of China, spoke after Biden spoke today, and basically said that you know China will be carbon neutral by 2060. Now, some have criticized that. But I mean, um, you know, Lindsay, as you pointed out, um, they're burning a whole lot of coal over there, which, yeah. which sort of seems yeah. ironic that if, if we're going to have, you know, that is their primary source of electricity. And all of these vehicles that we've seen rolled out by Chinese OEMs, um, real and imagined, um, 
you know, where's the electricity going to come from? You know, burning coal. So d does that help? I mean, is, is that a net save for the environment? And it seems like the answer to that may be mm, no. Yeah. yeah. To, to be fair, they are they are also involved in renewables, but the need for electricity is so great they can't they can't fulfill it alone with with renewables. But certainly, you know, it brings to mind what the naysayers had dubbed or do dub Bev's coal cars, um, mm -hmm. and and I I certainly don't want to see that happen. I don't think any proponent of Bev's does. But here, so here's a quick, just a quick question to the panel, the four of us. Uh, in the next eighteen months, does anyone on the panel here? Um, plan to buy an EV. All right. But first you got to say, does anybody plan to buy a car? Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, it's just like, <laughs> right. that's, that's, that's right. sort of a, uh, right. it's a loaded question, Lindsay. Yeah. Yeah. We'd all say no, <laughs> and, right. uh, but how many can buy a car? None. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I've been looking at used uh, EVs and, and PHEVs. Um, I'm on, I'm off of new cars. I'm sick of the monthly payment cycle. Mm -hmm. um, so I have been looking around. The thing that doesn't get talked about a whole lot, and I personally want to delve into this for, for wards, is the cost to insure an electric vehicle or a plug-in hybrid vehicle is much higher, even if they're older. Um, so Wow, yeah. why is that, Christy? Uh, I can't quite figure it out. I mean, you know, there's a battery warranty. When it expires, the cost is on me, you know? So I... I I don't, I don't understand the reasoning. I, you know, it, it's been said that, you know, they're more expensive. Well, yeah, but when they're five or 10 years old, they're not that expensive anymore. So especially, you know, if you've been paying attention to prices on used EVs, I mean, they're kind of in the toilet, sadly. Uh, yeah. other, other, other than Tesla, I mean, Tesla, you know, they, they still have pretty good value when they're. Yeah. When they're I, I was old. looking into it. Uh, you can get a Chevrolet Bolt EV with about 28,000 miles on it for about $15,000. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of great deals out there on Nissan Leafs under $10,000 for, for a Nissan Leaf. Um, but, you know, the reason that the Leaf is so cheap, and, I yeah, I've seen them at uh, $8,000, but they had early battery problems, too. The batteries yeah. lost their state of charge very quickly, and that drove down residual values. Hmm. All right, so so we 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 had heard earlier that General Motors was going to be all electric by 2035, and but they said that was a goal. And um, so in, in in an interview that um, Steve Carlyle, who's who's now um, GM president in in the United States, um, told Automotive News, eh, well that's that's really you know that's that's a goal that's not a guarantee. So is is General Motors sort of pulling back a little bit, or was this the intent all along that it would just simply be, yeah, if, if the market wants it, we'll provide it? Uh, well, the original statement was pretty wishy-washy too. So I don't know if it's pulling back um, so much as yeah. just em emphasizing <laughs> the fact that it's a goal. It's not a foregone conclusion. Um, like I said, you know, the BEV sector right now, we're at 2%. It's taken us 10 years to get to 2%. Uh, you can't base your whole company on on projected demand for BEVs because thus far we've not seen that much uptake. Well, I think too they've got to look at, I mean, this administration, will will these policies continue? We've just flip-flopped in the last eight years from Obama to Trump to Bush or to uh, uh, Biden now. Uh, and so is there sustainability in the politics behind this? And you know, the numbers that Biden has thrown out, they're not approved numbers. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's going to be, there's, it's going to be lower than what it is right now in terms of uh, resources for charging network and for, you know, just uh, just to kind of create a green halo over all of this uh, to convince people. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, the, the vehicle really has to sell itself. Uh, there's no question about that in every regard. I've got a pet peeve just about cold weather with EVs. I think they're terrible. And, uh, and, and you know, heat pumps, you know, cabin conditioning, all this kind of stuff. I'm sitting here in Troy looking at a huge parking lot. You know, if I didn't condition the battery, you know, in February, my car would be sitting out there at the end of the day cold. There's no conditioning. I'm going to get in a cold car and I'm going to push the heater button or not push it. 
if I push the heater button, maybe I don't get to Plymouth to, to, to home in the evening. Uh, if I don't push it, my feet are freezing by the time I get home. So, you know, there's a lot of technical issues with these things. And I think most customers outside of California really don't know the full story about living with an electric vehicle in a four season environment. Gee, Lindsay, you sound like a snowflake. No, I mean, I, about I, being I really, cold. You just, oh, it's so cold in my car. I really, I really like electric vehicles, like Christy says, you know. But, uh, but I still think they're right now they're a second car in the Midwest. Why? Why? Okay, so, so from where you live in Plymouth to where you go to work in Troy is what thirty miles one way. 40 miles. Yeah. 40 miles. Okay. Yeah. So is, is, is it conceivable that there would be an electric vehicle that you would, if you were buying a car in the next 18 months and decided to buy an EV, is there a vehicle that you would even consider that wouldn't have a range of 100 miles? Right. But I think I told you the story of driving a, driving a, a Kia EV from Plymouth to that Bronco sport intro up above Auburn Hills in, in October. And it was like, 50 degrees. Right. And so the range of the car, what it was telling me full battery was, this is a no, this is easy to do. And it turned out that I was kind of limping home on electrodes, not on fumes, but on electrodes. And that was kind of moderate temperature. So I, I guess I don't trust it. That's the whole thing yet. I really don't trust the mileages they talk about are California. They're very thermally kind of ideal driving situation. They're not what we go through here. Not to say we won't get there. I think we will, but they're not ready yet. Yeah, I, I would be for more truth in advertising on on range because it is very variable depending on your your climate. Um, uh, I, I have family though in California that bought a Tesla Model Y, and they're complaining about the range is not what they expected. So I think it goes beyond that. People need to relearn how to drive, learn how to drive, maybe in an efficient manner. If they've never driven before in an efficient manner. It's it's a skill that's going to have to be um, going to have to be learned. Uh, I, for me personally, I, I've had three Chevy Volts. I tried to avoid in the wintertime using the HVAC system as much as possible. Just stick with the heated seats, uh, you know. And then when I had a second gen model, I used the heated steering wheel as well. Um, I mean, sometimes I I did I did use the H. It was a if it was a bitterly cold day, but uh, for the most part, you just get used to being a little chillier than you normally would want to be. See, Lindsay, she can take it. You can I know. She's, it. I know. I know. I, <laughs> I've had training though. So you'll, you'll get, you'll get there. You'll get there. <laughs> what else you got there, Gary? Well, you know, it's, it's sort of interesting, you know, and, and this is sort of keeping with what, you know, what, what you're talking about, um, Lindsay is, is I, you know, for, for no apparent reason, except for the fact that it is Earth Day. Earth Day. I, I was looking at the miles per gallon combined um, for a variety of vehicles on fueleconomy.gov. Okay, so this is what the what the EPA comes up with, and I, I I was rather shocked to discover that. Okay, so so which truck? Okay, let's just this will be a quiz for you guys. Which truck has the lowest miles per gallon? This is a new vehicle. It comes from a company we're all familiar with. Um, and combined average, like average. Yeah. Okay. Combined. So it's, you know, city highway. And, and this is a truck mm -hmm. that I'm sure that, well, at least two out of the three of you would, would just adore. It's taking you on Christy. Uh, the so Wrangler, I, Wrangler with the 392 V8. It's a good guess. John. I no. just drove that. That's Ram TRX. Okay, mm. bonus points. What's the combined fuel average fuel efficiency? I, I want to say I, I had looked this up too. I don't recall offhand. I want to say twelve miles to the gallon. You are correct, sir. Wow. So a Rolls and Royce. Sell. Sell. A Rolls Royce <laughs> Phantom gives you fourteen miles per gallon. Okay, so this just gives you a, a sense of things. And, um, hey, wait, wait, one sec. I, I, I missed this completely. We got to take a quick commercial break and we'll be back to talk about more of this stuff. Give us 15 seconds. Let's go to that. All right. And we're back. Sorry. I, I, I had to get that in there. 
it's a good thing. So anyway, it, it, that that surprised me very much. Actually, it isn't the lowest. There's actually if you if you have a Bentley Chiron, you only get 11 miles per gallon. But you know, I'm thinking, you know, you buy a car that costs 350,000 bucks, you probably don't care about fuel economy. Fuel economy no. Yeah, I'm just saying. <laughs> Another the interesting thing that I, I I was surprised by, and and this this will be fair to our folks at to friends at Stellantis and at Ram, is that if you have a Silverado with the 5.3 liter V8 in it, and you use ethanol, you get 12 miles per gallon. So, so this 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 raises an interesting point that you know that you know environmentally we think oh ethanol is so much better for the environment, but then do you end up burning more of the stuff in order to achieve the same that you'd get with gasoline, which is a whopping 16 miles per gallon? Yeah, very right. very good point. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, if you live in Iowa, though, you're kind of helping the. I mean, everybody has different reasons for all of this stuff. Um, you know, there's trade offs that we all make in buying material things with certain materials in them. You can justify lower tailpipe emissions might mean higher upstream emissions. Uh, and some people don't care about either one. So uh, it's interesting. So so getting getting back to electric vehicles in. Um, so. The the guy who runs Polestar, um, Thomas Ingle Ingolath, I think his name is pronounced. John Shot knocking nodding his head. Yes, so that seems to be his name. Um, so so he he said some some I thought rather appropriate things regarding electric vehicle companies, reality versus electric vehicle companies that are perhaps not so real. And he says, and I quote, if Frankly, amazes me there are companies out there that are worth billions of dollars and have never made a car. I would like to today state clearly that the electric mobility revolution needs to be grounded in reality, not dreams. Is 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 there is there too much hype with with the whole electric vehicle phenomenon that's that's going on? Unlike anything we've I don't know maybe ever seen. Uh, it's a lot of hype. I don't know if it's more than autonomous vehicles, but it's, it's a lot of hype. And he's right. You know, a lot of these companies are probably never going to put out a vehicle that's going to sell very well. I, you know, it, or maybe never going to put out a vehicle, uh, and have it come to market. So I agree with him, but you know, I don't think there's a way to stop the speculation. Yeah. The, the problem I have gets back to the hybridization thing. You know, the mainstream media kind of confuses electric with electrification. And I draw that demarcation line with electrification, <laughs> including hybridization. Uh, so, yeah, you know, the battery, the battery BEV uh, a vehicle. Uh, yeah, I think there is hype around this right now. I mean, you know, but John, you know, I mean, going back into the beginning of the last century, what the papers in Detroit must have been in terms of new startup companies and new suppliers and, uh, you know, companies merging with other companies. You know, the Dodge brothers made powertrains for everybody and then they, you know, became part of Chrysler at some point and broke away from Ford. And, you know, I'm sure that the, in the news was the same thing, you know, stock prices and, you know, we're, we're kind of weathering this this dynamism right now. Uh, and it's going to go on for a long time. I, I got to say, Gary, I hope Canoe makes it because I've been advocating for cab over pickup trucks for a long time. And I just love the looks of that little thing. I hope somehow it, it gains some traction and gets into production. But uh, <laughs> well, Lindsay, you're absolutely right. I mean, if you go back 100 years ago, the hype was enormous. And there was a an investing frenzy in automotive stocks and automotive suppliers and the like, you know, and you fast forward to today and Gary, to your question, you bet there is a lot of hype, way too much hype. And the reason is everybody's hoping that the next startup is the next Tesla. And we've seen what Tesla stock has done in the last year, gone absolutely crazy. And so you're seeing so much money pouring into this segment, the EV segment, any, anything to do with it, the charging companies, the battery companies, anything to do with EV is getting all kinds of attention. You're seeing companies like uh, Delphi carve out its, its future stuff and spin it out as Aptiv. You're seeing other suppliers uh, renaming themselves just to take the name automotive out of their, their company name because the hype is all on electric. And now with the SPAC phenomena, 
these startups are able to get access to billions of dollars far more quickly than they ever were in the past, whether they went through the IPO route or they went, you know, hat in hand begging from the venture capital companies. And the reason is, like I said, everybody has got dollar signs in their eyes and they, they, they hope to make a killing on it. And, and I've been saying this, in fact, I, I, I wrote an uh, editorial for awards on this. It's going to come to a very bad end. It's a bubble right now. And mm. the bubble is going to burst. Yeah. In fact, we've already seen a little bit of that. Lordstown got nailed. Mm. Nicola got nailed. Uh, they haven't gone away. Yeah. But I mean, you know, you look at some of their stock valuations six months ago versus today. It's the the drop off has been horrific. And my guess is most of these startups are not going to make it. Some are going to thrive and become real players. Most of them are going to go out of business. That's my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Somewhat related to that was, did you guys see the news this week about Toyota Beyond Zero? They're coming out with a new brand. Toyota, one of the most admired brands in the world, Fortune Magazine, however many years running, decades running probably, feels like it can't sell electric vehicles under its own brand name. It's got to come but, out with. But is, is this going to be a sub-brand sort of like a Scion that's what I'm wondering. Uh, they say that the discussion of how it's going to be handled in the U.S. is, is still to come. Um, I, I, I I can't imagine the dealer body at this point being ready to uh, or, or wanting to invest in new showrooms and signage and all that. I, I think they'd probably sell it just within the Toyota showroom. But um, still, it was very interesting to me that they weren't going to sell under their they're not going to sell under their own brand name. Are they going to use, Christy, are they going to use BZ? Is that what they're going to use? Yeah, Beyond Zero is, yeah. is what that stands for, which electric vehicle is zero emission. So don't ask me what Beyond Zero is. But um, yeah, uh, the B BZ, BZ, and then it's going to be alphanumeric names that we uh, all love so much. Yeah. So, so, so again, going back to Scion, remember it was a Scion XA, the Scion XB, the Scion TC. That worked out real well, didn't it? <laughs> yeah. And, for a uh, while. They, they sold pretty well for a yeah. while. Right. Yeah. All right. So, so okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to sort of end this with, with a quiz, another quiz for you guys. So Boston Consulting Group since 2005 has gone to the leading innovation, innovation executives at companies around the world of all types, okay? And then they come up with the 50 most innovative companies in the world based on what these real executives say. Okay, so in the top 50 this year, there were four automotive companies on the list, okay? And three of these were OEMs, one of these is a supplier. Now, okay, you guys are immediately going to guess Tesla's on the list, and yes, okay, Tesla's one of the one of the four. So I'm not I'm not letting you have that one. That's too easy. Okay. Okay. Tesla was number five. Okay, so which is is pretty impressive. Last year it was number eleven. So this year, okay, so Boston Consulting Group, Tesla, fifth most innovative company of any type. Okay. And, and, you know, as you can, you know, no surprise, you know, that we're, we're talking Apple and, and, and Alphabet and, and Facebook and Disney and companies like this. Okay. So what are the other three companies, other three automotive companies in the top 50 in terms of innovation? Okay. So now I'm left with two OEMs and one supplier company. Mm -hmm. So who, who wants to take a guess at what? And are they are they incumbent uh, as we would understand automakers to be, or are they like Waymo? These, these, these are brand names you would know. Okay, that in okay. so it's 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 nothing. Um, I'll 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 throw out there Volkswagen. Yeah, I agree. Volkswagen, I um, LG LG. And you know CATL. <laughs> John's gonna get it. <laughs> you guys are, I'm you guys gonna are guess good. Toyota only because Toyota is typically at the top of the list of automakers who generate patents. They generate more patents than any other car company. They on the list, Gary? And this is why John's the co-host of this show because mm -hmm. he is correct. Toyota is is number twenty one on the list, and it's the top OEM. 
and it's up 20 positions from last year. So it's it's done very well. All right. So now so now you're left with one supplier and one OEM. Innovation. Okay. So again, I'll, I'll go with supplier. And just based on th the same criteria I used to choose Toyota, I'll choose Bosch because I believe Bosch generates more patents than any other supplier. Christy, Lindsay? I, I was going to say Bosch as well. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll agree with Bosch. And I'd throw in uh, Mercedes or Daimler for the other OEM. So do you want to do another O you want to do another OEM before I, I reveal whether you're right or not about Bosch? Um who would I go with? I I I'm gonna go with Mercedes or Daimler, you know, same thing, Mercedes. All right. Christy? Uh BMW. So it's Bosch, 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 Daimler, Daimler, BMW. Is that is that right? I think that's right. Okay. Okay. You're all right about Bosch. It is it is number 30 on the list of the top 50 most innovative companies in the world. And it is up three positions from last year. Okay. Okay. As for the most innovative company in the auto world that's left. So we have Daimler, Daimler, BMW, Hyundai. Oh, Oh, well, very good, interesting. Good for them. Hun yeah. Hyundai, yeah. Hyundai comes in at number 39, and last year it wasn't even on the list. Hmm. So, um, now, is that Hyundai Group or is that Hyundai Automotive? Hyundai Automotive. Oh, wow. Well, I mean, so, so, yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's the automotive part of Hyundai. So, yeah. But I mean, it doesn't include, because yeah, as you know, Hyundai's into all kinds of things steel right. making, ship making, electronics, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, so. but so is Daimler. So you guys were mm -hmm. you were thinking in terms of cars, but uh, yeah, very very interesting that it's in. But the thing is, is that it surprises me the companies that aren't on the list. Okay, the, of the top fifty, I mean Ford, um, you know Honda. Well, yeah. what's General their criteria? What, what's their criteria, yeah. Gary? Because well, the if it's counts and patents, then it's it's pretty easy. No, no, to figure it is. Out. It is. Yeah. It's, it's, they go to executives who are basically the executives who are in charge of innovation for companies, for leading companies in the world, and they say to these people, you know, what do you think are the most innovative companies? And and they say, okay, this is who it is. And uh, so, damn, John, you were you were doing great there. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Until you threw that Hyundai monkey wrench into the mix. <laughs> but good for yeah. Hyundai. That, that's pretty yeah, impressive. Yeah. Hey, mm -hmm. do we have time for me to ask everybody here a question, one final question? Sure. sure. Yeah. Buy e we're going to buy EVs in 18 months? Well, it kind of it kind of fits into sustainability. <laughs> but if, if Volkswagen hadn't gotten caught cheating on emission certification, okay, and assuming that Tesla was already on a trajectory and growth and so forth. So they're pushing this, the, you know, EV startup company. But you don't have the German government kind of forcing Volkswagen, everybody paying fines, uh, you know, everything that happened in the aftermath of Dieselgate. Where would we be right now? Uh, well, there'd be no Electrify America network. <laughs> that, that's, wow, that's for sure. Wow, great point. Great yeah. point. Yeah. Uh, so, so are you asking Lindsay uh, whether whether Volkswagen would be as dedicated to EVs as they seem to be? Had well, it but I mean that, that was kind of I think Dieselgate affected Mercedes, it f affected FCA, uh, and it really became this kind of very public, uh, you know, I, I don't want to say you know stake in the heart of of combustion engines in a lot of ways, you know. Uh, the EV thing was still going on and kind of you know on a kind of lower trajectory. Uh, but I see Dieselgate as, you know, just a lot of factors in what's what's happening today. Uh, I just want to know how you you three felt about this. Lindsay, I, I think you're really on to something there. I really do. Because um, when you take Europe as an example, I mean, Dieselgate changed the whole political calculation in Europe, yeah. which heretofore the auto industry there had committed to diesel. That was its solution to CO2 emissions because diesels, displacement to displacement emit 25% less CO2 than a gasoline engine. And that was the path that Europe was going down on. And as you know, with their test procedures, 
it was easy breezy as well. I mean, they 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 had uh, an advantage, even though on paper their emission standards were tougher than in the U.S., the test was so easy breezy, you could get away with a lot more in Europe than you could in the U.S. with emissions. Dieselgate changed that whole calculation. Now they've got, with the, the WLTP, it's still not as strict as the EPA standard, but it's a whole lot stricter than it was before. And they're doing random testing of real vehicles out on the road. Yeah, tailpipe. So I, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that that drives a, a discipline that makes it uh, very dangerous to cheat. Then they implemented these massive fines if you miss the CO2 targets, which are already tough, get tougher in 2025 and tougher still in 2030. And so I don't think you would have had the political will to drive that kind of discipline on the auto industry if not for Dieselgate. It changed the whole political calculation. So at least for the European industry, it had a massive impact. Yeah. And China's another you know, thing. China's going down the, the, the whole path to, to electrification and it's Volkswagen's biggest market and, and Daimler's and BMW's by the way too. So that they were gonna go heavy on electric if only because of China. But I, I think you're really onto something. Dieselgate really changed things in Europe. Okay, so so let me get this straight. So so basically, a car company was caught cheating on its emissions, yeah. and and therefore, it wasn't meeting the regulations, and therefore they made stricter regulations. And as a result of the stricter regulations, now electrification is a requirement, and um, compression and ignition is done. Is that it? Well, I think I think there's some of those elements are in this whole equation, you know. Uh, I mean, Europe was. We all love diesel. The, the four of us here. I mean, if you look at Ward's ten best engines, I mean, it was you know new diesels were coming in, and we were all driving these yeah. diesel cars, and they just kept getting better and better. And Volkswagen's uh, you know revenue was tied to the diesel engine, uh, and and all of a sudden this happens, and I think it really caught everybody's attention about. You know the the bad old auto industry. Here's this giant company cheating, um, and it took a look at combustion engines just as Tesla was starting to really kind of gain some traction, and be, and be a serious company, not a profitable company, but you know it was you know moving ahead. Um, it's just an interesting. It, it's interesting to look at where we are right now. I just have no. I wanted to ask you guys that. So, so the people in Brussels said, you know what? There's that company Tesla. That's pretty cool. Let's let's get on VW's case because uh, Tesla's cool. No, no, I don't think that. I just think there there are two things happening simultaneously. Uh, diesel gate with combustion engines, particularly the diesel, but it really swept gas engines into it too. And because VW being as big as it is. Uh, you know, they, they had to do a complete turnaround. They had to commit to Angela Merkel and, and, the, and, the, and the Greens and everybody else that they would completely change. I mean, they got taken out behind the woodshed and horse whipped over this. Uh, and, and there goes their, their, their increasing revenue with diesel engines. So, I mean, it's not like I'm looking forward to, you know, looking back at the, at the past as being a better thing. It's just that I, I think we would be way, way way off the mark right now if it had that hadn't happened mm, well wow. the, the eu is pretty progressive on environmental regulations i'd like to think it would have happened anyway uh who knows but you're right I, it, it definitely accelerated things for sure yeah. I mean, just like I said, you just look at the CO2 standard that just kept slipping and slipping, uh, you know, grams per kilometer. And uh, they were they were, you know, really put that off because of the market because of the market on that. So um, we'll, we'll just have to see now. Now, VW, you know, has, uh, you know, an entire model line filled with electric vehicles, but they still make diesels and they still make gas engines, yeah. too. So a customer has the choice. Well, real good. I, I think with that, we should wrap it up. Christy, thanks so much for coming back on the show. Thanks. Same John. with Had you, Lindsay. Time. Yeah, yeah this no. Is a, this is a great this conversation today. Great conversation. Totally agree. So, Gary, you and I will just keep on doing these shows. We will. And, Lindsay, thank you for being on the show. Oh, well, th thanks. 
It's great. It's always, always a pleasure. Okay, everybody. Thanks for having tuned in. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, solutions for your journey, and by Magna. Visit our website, autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday afternoons. Get your daily fix with AutoLine Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with AutoLine This Week. There's all that and much more at AutoLine.tv.